It's my very great honor and pleasure to chair this panel. And I have the most powerful um, uh, people together. But first of all, I'd, here's the professor. Let's acknowledge him again. <laughs> I'm Wangari Wagoro, and I'll be chairing this panel. We have uh, to my far right left, uh, Dr. Louisa Egbunike, who will be talking about Chinua Achebe and the Igbo Nigerian novel. Next to her and next to me, I'm very proud to see my dear friend, Sefi Atta, who is uh, Dr. Sefi Atta, who will be looking. <laughs> She's uh, challenging me, but it's OK. <laughs> But we do recognize that she's an award-winning author, and she will be looking at um, taking stock. I have to my right uh, Dr. James Gibbs, who will tell us his title soon. Next to him is Dr. Um, Balibu Musisia. And we have our discussant, um, who is Siko Mazu Gadi. Um, who will be uh, our discussant for the session. What we're going to do is we're all going to speak very briefly um, in order, and then we will have a Q&A. Uh, we'll have our discussant respond, and then we'll have a Q&A, if that's okay. And it's my great pleasure to call upon uh, Sefi Atta to be our first speaker. You can use the podium, or you can sit here, but it's yeah. nice Sorry. to go to you. While Sefi um, is going to the uh, podium, I'll tell you a little bit um, about... I have told you, haven't I? Yes, okay, go ahead. Good morning. Just my luck to speak after Wally <laughs> And then to do the long walk of shame. <laughs> What an honor it is to be here. Let me just add, I'm not an academic, so please don't judge. <laughs> you know, earlier this year when Dr. Ajiman Dua invited me to this conference, I was so keen to participate on, uh, on the panel. And then when I learned who the other members of the panel would be, I thought I might be better off in the audience. Still. I am thrilled to be present at this celebration of the 1962 Makerere University Writers Conference. It took place two years before I was born. And as I have not read actual transcripts of what was discussed by those in attendance, I can only rely on other people's accounts. It's astonishing that Shoinka, J.P. Clark, and others were only in their 20s and 30s at the time of the conference. As a writer who's old enough to appreciate its significance and young enough to be classified with a new generation of African writers, it seems to me that my purpose today is to give some insight into what my generation is up to. I mean, if we're talking about a legacy, we really ought to take stock of how those who have inherited that legacy are keeping it. And I don't have good news, I'm afraid. Now, I will speak from the point of view of a novelist and a playwright, as I don't know enough about what is happening in the fields of poetry and nonfiction. I will also speak from a Nigerian perspective, because having attended events with writers from other African countries and heard what they had to say regarding people who generalize about the continent, I'd better not do that. My Nigerian experience is, however, within the context of the greater African scope. Finally, I won't mention names, as Prof did, because I don't care to get into Trump-like Twitter feuds. <laughs> it is appropriate that the panel discussion today is a reflection of the 1962 conference, because its legacy to me is in its historical importance. All I can do is look back on it with respect and without sentimentality. I imagine the circumstances that prompted the previous generation of writers to organize the conference were as problematic as those that writers face today. The one trait writers have in common is that we're constantly complaining about our situations. No state of affairs, past, present, or future is good enough for us. 
So I'm sure the 1962 conference focused on social and political conflicts of the day, such as the struggle for independence, the tussle between capitalism on the one hand and the other, and on the other, Marxism and socialism, and the issue of how Western cultures interfered and impinged, impinged sorry, on African cultures, including our languages and negritude. Today, on African literature panels, after an initial period when we talked about the damage done by dictatorship and the supposed merits of democracy, we are now more likely to discuss transnationalism and all manner of identity politics that concern our audiences more than they concern us. I always seem to be on panels where Afropolitanism, as it has recently been redefined, feminism and other such topics are on the table. I once found myself with a group of Nigerian writers who were explaining to an audience in France why they were citizens of the world. I thought it was patronizing to be put in that position and said it wasn't my duty to demonstrate my global credentials. But a fellow Nigerian writer promptly took the mic from me and declared that he saw absolutely nothing wrong with having the, the discussion. Later, he told me I was taking it too seriously. <laughs> I, should, <laughs> I should just have said something to please the crowd. <laughs> On the subject of feminism, I have sometimes had the same reluctance to justify myself whenever I'm expected to respond to or make sweeping statements about African women. One development I am grateful for is that African literature no longer has a man's face. Though I will affirm any day that the men who attended the Makarere conference were the best writers of their generation. Yes, the predominance of men at the conference, 15 men, four women I counted, had something to do with the way education for girls and women were regarded back then. If you were a girl whose parents valued education, you attended primary and secondary school, if your parents could afford further training for you, you went into nursing or education. If you came from a family that saw no limit to your potential, you became a lawyer, doctor, or accountant. So from the educational sector, we had writers like Flora Wapa, Mabel Shegun, and Zulu Shofola. But they were not present at the conference, which must have required of its participants an exceptional level of scholarship. And it wasn't that women couldn't qualify or keep up with the discussions. There were just not many of them in the League of the Men who attended the conference for the reasons I have given. Mind you, there were not many men in that league either. These days, the face of African literature is more likely to be a woman's, which may be a welcome development, but not necessarily a fairer one. I personally find it strange to be praised for writing while being female and African. Those of us who write have at least had the privilege of higher education. Yes, we might get more questions about writing from a female perspective, but men are sometimes criticized for writing from a male point of view. Getting back to the legacy of the Makerere Conference, if I may generalize about that generation of African writers and mine, I would say the former swam against the tide of colonialism, while the latter is riding the wave of globalization. There are obvious reasons for this. The first generation's reach was restricted to classrooms and lecture rooms. They didn't have the internet. When Amazon.com came into being in 1994, I had just moved to America and initially their books were not available to order. Now, a writer in Nigeria can in an instant reach a literary agent in London or New York. And it doesn't matter whether the agents have any knowledge about Africa's lit literature or its history. Agents are looking for works they can sell to mainstream readers and for writers who don't mind being commodified and branded. So we are being Columbused. They have discovered us. <laughs> I didn't invert that, invent that term, by the way. It's, it's, it's out there on the street. And we are winning international prizes. The foreign prices that once confined us to our co continent have come under criticism. In reaction, we have established our own local awards. It would seem like a buoyant time for African literature. It certainly has all the makings of a renaissance. But I sense a general dissatisfaction with the space that African literature occupies within the world of literature. I've heard charges of tokenism and even racism in literary capitals such as London and New York as well as accusations against writers who are adjudged to sell out and pander. 
comparisons are made between writers who are based in Africa and writers who live elsewhere, there's a palpable lack of unity. We are less likely to embrace Pan-Africanism as the previous generation did and more likely to engage in tribalism. So even though we might seem like a unified body of writers, we are in essence balkanized. By the way, tribalism afflicts other artistic fields in Nigeria, fine arts, the music industry, and Nollywood. At first, it was baffling to me that creative people could be at once broad-minded and parochial. Then I decided to be independent instead of trying to fit into a fractured community. It wasn't always like this. In 2005, when my first novel, Everything Good Will Come, was published, there was a sense of possibility for writers of my generation. I remember I once remarked in an interview that it wasn't the first time African resources had been up for grabs and we ought to be wary of systematic attempts to divide us. I didn't know how prophetic my words would be. In 2005, new Nigerian writers had the stage. We caught the attention of readers and literature was relevant again. Books were being sold, new publishing houses were established and they operated in different ways from those that had been around since colonial times. They were sending writers on publicity to us. Literary editors were reviewing our work. The arts pages were the one place in Nigerian newspapers where you didn't have to pay for promotion. But soon, these same new publishers were reduced to soliciting funds from banks. Literary editors became bloggers or cultural consultants or prospective authors. Some of them, in their bids to get ahead, ingratiated themselves with writers who they thought might help them and denigrated those they deemed competitors. One or two who were unsuccessful as authors were later recruited by the government as PR officers, or as I would call them, propagandists. When my last novel, A Bit of Difference, was published in England in 2014, it was reviewed in the main UK newspapers. The year before it had come out in Nigeria, where an editor made a passing remark about it, referring to it as Sefiata's My Best Friends Are Corrupt Novel. That was it for reviews. Because I've been off the lecture circuit for a while, I have not been privy to what has transpired in academic circles within and outside the continent. But I am aware of a slow and steady dedication to African literature. I guess because academic reviews require in-depth research, they cannot be churned out as quickly as media reviews in the UK Guardian or Times, for instance. However, I recently read an article about the return of the Guardian Literary ser Series in Nigeria which pointed out that, in fact, it's not worthwhile for academics there to review a novel in a newspaper. They are better off publishing their reviews in journals in countries as far-flung as Afghanistan in order to make progress in their careers. I also recall talking to a Nigerian academic in America who sort of confessed, she was speaking in the second person, that she was reluctant to review books by new generation writers because, in her words, once or in both decide on the African writers they like, they ignore everyone else. I hadn't the foggiest idea what she meant. The result of this is that my generation of Nigerian writers has, on the whole, lost some of the momentum we had in 2005. Unless you have made your mark overseas, unless you have tenacity and remain productive, you are off stage now. The rest of us have cameo appearances when we ought to function as a Greek chorus. The political and commercial elite have taken center stage and they happen to be the only ones supporting literature. Politicians and writers have always made strange bedfellows. That is nothing new. It is the same precarious relationship that artists have with wealthy people. I know the previous generation of writers also had their share of disagreements and recriminations, but I'm fairly sure they would have balked at the idea of a political satire funded, endorsed, and promoted by the government the success of which is attributed to being non-confrontational. I am certain they would have opposed the idea of an African literature, liter literary prize solely for novels written, or, sorry, written in or translated into English, funded by a local corporation that offers the winner a chance to be mentored by a British writer who penned what I would call a modern Tarzan in the jungle novel. This is where we are now. And I bring up these examples not because I take issue with the individuals involved. I actually admire their gumption 
but I also worry about the impact on African literature. So, to borrow from Hillary Clinton, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> What happened to my generation of writers, that is? Enterprise happened. Enterprise is compatible with the business world and political sphere. It is at home on the internet and familiar with shortcuts there. It is ready to maximize results. I looked up the origin of the word enterprise out of curiosity and came across the synonym endeavor, which I also researched. Endeavor comes from an old French phrase, to be put in duty. It's about earnest and conscientious activity rather than the end result. So accidentally, I found a suitable description of the legacy of the Macarere Conference, the endeavor of the previous generation. They confronted circumstances that they refused to tolerate. These days, for the most part, we play the hand we are dealt. We do what we have to do to get ahead at all costs and sometimes at the cost of African literature. My contribution to the anthology, The Gods Who Send Us Gifts, which will be later, launched later today, is an excerpt from my as yet unpublished novel made in Nigeria. It is titled The Conference and it is set in the United States at an African Literature Association conference. The novel is partly dedicated to the previous generation of writers. I named up everyone from Shoinka to Aikwe Ama and from Nadine Godima to Bessie Head. I recreate classes I taught on Amaya Teidu's Our Sister Killjoy and on Buchi Mecheta's The Joys of Motherhood. I have quotes by Ben Okri and J.P. Clark. I was unwittingly play, paying tribute to their endeavors. So it is indeed a gift that I am on this panel today. If you feel duty bound to do your best for African literature, the new order of enterprise can isolate you. Here, I have company, and I am in good company. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sethi. Um, it's my great pleasure to call upon uh, Professor Paliva Msisia to talk about the Kampala Conference the genesis of enduring antinomy. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to this historic moment. Um, Kampala, um, Makere, I think, as we all know, uh, was the genesis of um, what we call African uh, critical practice. And um, my argument is that, in fact, um, it did, Professor Schenkel mentioned antinomies, that it did also engender some of the antinomies that have been persistent in the criticism of African uh, literature. And those antinomies were crystallized in uh, Obi Wali's essay, The Dead End of African Literature. Um, and I just want to rehearse some of those antinomies that are generated in that essay and also responses to that essay. Fundamentally, it's about the opposition between authentic and inauthentic African literature, authentic and inauthentic African criticism. Um, it's also about um, African languages as a sign of authenticity, uh, European languages and lang African literatures in European languages as necessarily and inherently inauthentic. Um, but also the idea of authentic African subjectivity versus inauthentic African subjectivity. Uh, writers who write in European languages are accused of being inauthentic Africans, and Wally talks about how um, they, could ne they couldn't actually have felt 
African if they were able to, uh, if they wrote in English languages, for instance, or French languages, because an African writer who feels African and thinks African will, will necessarily translate the Africanness or African identity into an African language. The moment they write in an African, in an English language, for instance, or a European language, then that they cannot have had that moment of authenticity within their own um, uh, self-consciousness. Um, and this proceeds to ideas about negritude versus um, the rest of the African writers. And Wally sees himself as uh, uh, continuing with the tradition of negritude and also to Tuwala, whom he sees as part and parcel of the negritudist um, authentic discourse. And there was a lot of anger to that, yes, including <laughs> expressed by Professor Schoenka here. And I think some of that anger was because Wally, in essence, was constructing what I would call superficial and false opposition. Um, I cannot believe that the gathering of writers there, Parallele, uh, Achebe, and so forth, all those writers were actually colonized in their consciousness. And some of that anger, I think, was about uh, a misrecognition of uh, the fundamental question facing African literature at that moment. And, and I think that's what generated some of that anger. But perhaps it's a suspicion of hypocrisy, because um, while he, for instance, attacked the critics um, and writers, um, uh, Shoenka, um, Okibo, Achebe, and others, uh, for being Ibadan, using Ibadan English, when in fact Wally himself had graduated from Ibadan. And in fact, Wally himself wrote his trenchant criticism of the other writers in English. <laughs> and in what presumably is Ibadan English. So how could Wally allow himself the possibility of being an African and expressing his African critique of other Africans in English and not allow the same possibility or privilege to the other writers. So I think there was that fundamental contradiction which amounts to the fact that Wally essentially had located himself outside uh, his historical uh, moment and also the history of his cultural and intellectual socialization, which was no different from the history of cultural socialization, subject formation of everybody else gathered at um, uh, Kampala. Now, that dichotomy, which fundamentally can be reduced to an either or logic, you're either African or not African. If you're African, you write in an African language. If you're not an African, you write in a European language. Or if you write in a European language, you cannot be an African. So it's a sort of either or logic. And I was glad uh, Professor Schoenker concluded this talk by talking about a harmonization rather than polarity, moving from polarity to harmonization. I think that essay intensified polarity, and that polarity was what Freud, I think, describes as a narcissism of small differences. And it was a displacement, in my view, of what Fanon describes as uh, the colonial Manichaeanism, i.e., that opposition between the native and the colonizer into the opposition between uh, the patriotic uh, cultural nationalist in Africa and the comprador um, African uh, writer. And this is very interesting. I, I think that Wally is in fact um, transferring an opposition which is evident in the public sphere of formal 
decolonization politics, um, whereby uh, usually uh, it happened in most of the continent, uh, you have a competition for public space in terms of ideologies. And there is the invention of the Comprador, for instance, in Ghana. You have Nkrumah, who returns in the late 40s from Britain to Ghana. And there's Dankwa. Dankwa, who is a gradualist, Nkrumah who wants to speed things up, and Dankwa gets ca uh, cast as a uh, Comprador. And in the end, we know what happened to him. He died in prison. Equally, you have uh, in Zambia, Kenneth Kaunda, younger than Nkumbula, Harry Nkumbula, Harry Nkumbula, uh, the leader, uh, then is seen as rather gradualist in terms of uh, his ideology, in, in terms of decolonization. So the, the debate is about this, over the speed of decolonization. And um, Kumbula is cast as a comprador, and, uh, and actually very few people have ever heard of Nkumbula. Harin Kumbola. And of course, there are the examples in Zimbabwe, um, Malawi, for instance, um, Manoa Chira, uh, who uh, is the leader, is castigated as uh, uh, Comprador, Kwame, uh, Kanyama Chiwumi, and Chipembere as the radicals. And in the radicalness, they invite Dr. Hastings Banda, who, in the name of Africa, uh, chases them out into exile in Tanzania. And, and so I believe that this is what is being shifted into the domain of African literary production and criticism. So while he was constructing Comprador versus a nationalist, um, genuine nationalist sort of opposition, and against an either or uh, uh, debate, uh, and, and which hasn't done us very well uh, in, in terms of what has happened since then. And I'm, and it is also reproduced subsequently in the various debates um, about the nature of African literature, memorably uh, between Achebe and Ngogi and the question of African language, uh, in which Achebe is uh, recast by Ngogi as slightly of dubious nationalist credentials. But we all know, um, those of us who have read Achebe, um, that in fact things fall apart is an enduring critique of colonialism, and it cannot simply be presented as uh, a compromise text. And Achebe himself, I think. Um, it's also reproduced in terms of uh, Chinwezu and company in relation particularly to Shoinka, where Shoinka is condemned as a Euro modernist and is part of a invest of Leeds conspiracy to recolonize Africa. And, and therefore inauthentic. So you have Chinwezu, who is pushing for a kind of orality-based kind of literature and criticism as the representation of a genuine nationalist African identity. And of course, it's very interesting that in this context, Achebe, who in the context of uh, Ngugi's discussion is seen as, um, as a doge nationalist, here he, in the Chinwezu moment, he's the quintessential nationalist in opposition to Wale Shoinka. And also the argument, re, uh, the opposition resurfaces um, in an important essay by a uh, brilliant and exciting writer, Helen Habila, uh, the, Af the African Renaissance. Habila is making a distinction between his generation and the older generation and argues that there is a renaissance, and that renaissance has to do with this group, the new writers, greater connection uh, to Africa, and the older writers essentially are represented as elitist in the same idiom as in Wally's 1962-63 essay, elitist and alienated from the people, as it were. So the new writers, uh, the cosmopolitan writers that Sefi was talking about, are seen as more authentic than the old writers or the older writers. So 
And most recently and most disturbingly, a chap called Gilles uh, caused a lot of controversy um, by actually arguing uh, in Third World Quarterly a few months ago that, in fact, nationalist criticism of colonialism has failed and that Achebe, in fact, supports uh, colonialism. And this essay, uh, which is a case for recolonization of Africa, essentially um, uses this argument of authenticity and inauthenticity as, in fact, a rationalization that uh, some of our nationalist writers were, in fact, supporters of colonialism. Now, I started off with Wally's essay, The Dead End of African Literature, but I think when you get to the point where Achebe is being presented as a supporter of colonialism, this is the dead end of that discussion <laughs> uh, that started at Macquarie, this uh, simplification, uh, but also displacement of fundamental positions onto false oppositions of an either or logic. Instead, what I propose uh, is that, it's very close to what Professor Shoenka was saying here, is that I think we need to move away from some of these simplistic polarities. Um, what happens in 1962 is that I'm using Boudieu, Boudieu Pierre Boudieu, not Pierre Boudieu, um, Alain, ba Alain Badieu, was a fundamental shift in the transcendental values of African, or African literature, but also Africa generally. And perhaps the debate shouldn't have been who is a true African writer and who isn't. Should have been about how the different writers construct their post-colonial African identities or conceptualized their African identities. At the same time, I'm aware of the positive and radical potential of Wally's argument. And that has to do with the importance of always remembering. Uh, the remembering this space of the past, this space of uh, colonization. And so Wally was right in reminding us of the fact that uh, we don't decolonize simply by being African, that we need to be alert to the different ways in which we constitute our subjectivity. So my proposal would be for the focus on a post-hybrid conception of an African identity. I think I'll stop there. It's warming up, as you can hear. Our next speaker will be Dr. James Gibbs. Uh, while James goes to the podium, all the biographies are in the program, so you can follow them there. Thank you. Thank you very much. It is indeed a, a privilege to be here, and I am very grateful to those who invited me from something that Iva said at the beginning, there may be some who are under the impression that my uh, knowledge of this Kampala event was some ways first-hand. My knowledge is entirely second-hand. I'm a consumer of the reports of the conference. And one of the interesting things is that there were very few reports that I've been able to locate. There was one by Ezekiel Faleli and another by Lewis and Cosey, and a third by Bernard von Long. Incidentally, none of those mentioned anything about a tiger or tigritude. That is something that has been, I've been asked about over the years. Was it said? I'm sure it was, but the reporters did not report it. Um, there was, by Gerald Moore, a very powerful address, very trenchant account of Francophone literature in which they were referred to as posturing writers. And it is possible 
and, and perhaps Professor Schoenke will recall, whether it was partly in the context of that discussion that he made his remark. I didn't give my paper a title because of the whole way in which this conference has been pulled together and the whole way in which I think part of the importance of the McCarrory Conference is to make us look at conferences. How do these things come together? Ten days ago, I was asked to contribute to uh, a panel that looked back at Kampala 62. And I was very happy to do that because I felt I had one or two things to say. First of all, about this failure to report the Tigritude remark. Um, but then I also came across some young people, young people in a spanking new hub in Bristol University to do with black humanities, who didn't know anything about the organization of this 1962 conference. If you look at this picture, you don't get the picture, the real picture, at all. Who pulled that conference together? Are they in this picture? You look at the picture and you think, that's interesting. In order to go to that conference, if you were a man, you probably had to have a tie. <laughs> that, that was a very strange uh, kind of qualification. But actually, who was, who was selecting the people to go? And I hope that in the course of this discussion, people will, will give me some more information about this. But it looked to me, from the literature, from the reports, that Mfaleli was one of those who was involved, Uli Bayer and Gerald Moore were the key people. And they brought together writers of whom they approved and who they thought were going to make an important contribution. I, I note that on the uh, SOAS um, pages and, and on Africa in words, there is a write-up about this conference which assumes that we don't know who was at the uh, Kampala conference. That is quite extraordinary, to, to embark on an academic exercise of this kind without being absolutely sure who was there. Fortunately, we, we do have some clues. In the years since the conference, there has been a lot of writing. We have a biography of Uli Bayer, we have a biography of Chindua Achebe, and it is Zenwa Oheto who has the fullest list that I have found of people who attended that conference. But the extraordinary thing is that the other white people who were so important in this conference are not in this photograph. Pe people like Van Mill, who made an epoch-marking telephone call to Heinemann in London, saying Chinua Chebi has met uh, James Ngugi, as he was then called, and we are going to publish his novel Sight Unseen. James Curry, who, who's sitting here, has, has described this graphically in his Africa Writes Back. So now we have the benefit of that kind of knowledge about the people involved in the conference and about the extraordinary things that the conference achieved as far as, well, the setup of the Heinemann African Writers Series and that one direction in which African writing moved. The conference, it is clear, was very concerned to discuss who are the gatekeepers? Who's making the decision? And who's publishing us? And my word, I've just had such an experience out there in the foyer that I will share it with you. They're selling a book called Homegoing, and they're pushing it hard. He said, please read this book. It's a very good book. Now, one of the things about Homegoing is that it seems to me that it's been marketed very well. The author has made a tour of many places. She came to Bristol. When she was there, I said, oh, are you going to Ghana? Oh, no, no plans to go to Ghana at all. And yet this book that was awarded a $1 million advance and so hit the headlines for many of us um, has been allowed through, it seems to me, entirely by American New York publishers and their, and, and their uh, publicity machines. They, want a new, <coughs> they wanted a new Chimamanda. I think, and that's why she got published. When we're talking about authenticity, and when we're talking about who is getting published, I think we ought to look at that process, and, and we ought to uh, hope that Ghanaian critics will respond to it. Um, I, I 
attended an event, perhaps some of you did. I'd be interested to know who, who, who went to Port Cullis House in August 2016 when Professor Schoenker spoke and this book was launched. One, two, and an extraordinary occasion. Thank you very much. An extraordinary occasion, as this is an extraordinary occasion. On that occasion, we had a full theater of the Santihini and his drummers and his umbrella carriers. And we had not only Professor Schoenker, but um, Lord Boateng and Gus Casely Hayford. These are not people who are usually standard bearers or spear carriers in, in somebody else's main drama. But on that occasion, they had relatively minor roles. And on that occasion, um, not only was this book launched, the uh, May Their Shadows Never Shrink, but also uh, a book of short stories. And again, I want to look at what was really happening in that book of short stories, Aibia's book of short stories. I, I was delighted to find in it a novella by Peggy Appiah. I think Peggy Appiah is a neglected writer. I think particularly in the year, uh, years in which we're looking at Soretsi Karma's marriage, we should give her some attention. She, she was a very serious writer, not just a children's writer, and she persevered with all kinds of publishing strategies. Fortunately, um, I, I, I've uh, had the manuscript and was able to put it into the, into the novel. And, and so I used my review of that book to draw attention to how serious and important that was. I, 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 uh, I did criticize Iva because he included three of his own stories, and that was more than anybody else. And uh, Ama Ata Edu only had one. Now, just what role an editor has, I, I take the liberty of, of speaking as, as uh, well, an older person, perhaps, in this context, to say, well, I wouldn't have done that. We've got to look again and again at what is happening. I think that book was partly published, and uh, I can be corrected on this, so that there might be a chance of winning the Kane Prize. We are acutely aware of who is setting agendas, but I think this is, uh, this is uh, uh, another aspect that we ought to look at. And when we read in uh, uh, Africa in words that the highlight of this occasion is not the paper that we've been uh, able to listen to from Professor Schoenke, but the book launch this afternoon, then I must disagree entirely. Uh, um, that book is, is, is useful. Many books should flourish. A thousand flowers, a million flowers should bloom. But we, we should also be aware that publishers have strategies and that Aibia had a wonderful success with a short story in uh, Amayat Edu's collection uh, of, of uh, stories from Africa. And, and obviously there is a temptation and a need, uh, uh, perhaps a co commercial need, to continue with that. I'm moving quite a long way from, uh, from the notes that I had made, but I was struck by the way in which uh, they pushed homegoing at me, when in fact I don't think it ties in with the authenticity of uh, uh, African literature. But as I say, I think that's a debate for, uh, for <coughs> Ghanaians in particular. I, I couldn't help bringing along a few wonderful books because although everybody's looking at their laptops and their mobile phones. In looking at uh, the McKerry Conference, we are looking at publishing, and we're looking at publishing in hard copy. Things like Black Orpheus, how important it was, and what a wonderful physical item it is. I also brought along a copy of Encounter to remind us of how the whole story of the um, CIA backing of this conference exploded. Um, I also brought along something uh, just to show what Mbari was doing in terms of, uh, of, of other publishing. And finally, I brought along something that's just arrived, a journal from, from Ghana that has an account not of the CIA's funding of this conference, which I think was relatively harmless. Um, I think the people took the money and ran. I think they had an interesting time and <laughs> benefited from it. <laughs> But what was much more sinister, and that people don't talk about nearly enough, is the CIA backing for moral rearmament, which really had an impact 
in West Africa, Central Africa, and in Kenya. Azikiwe was completely taken in by moral rearmament. And they had money and they had the ability to take productions around. I think I'm going to wind up on, on, on this theater moment because I, I've uh, used up my, my 10 minutes. But please, if you really want to, to waste an hour and a half, look at a film called Freedom Online. There it was, made by MRA, but fronted entirely by Africans. So you don't see any European names on the credits at all. It was put together, and uh, the story is told in, the, in this journal, that's why I mention it, one of um, Professor Schoenker's age mates, Ifogali Amata, was, was very much involved with it. And he himself wrote a very perceptive article about the way in which film, notably the crowning experience, Men of Brazil, was being used to put forward a very bland but fundamentally anti-communist message. There they were, saving Africa from communism. I'm going to close with another comment on the theater because many things came out of the conference. Ezekiel Mfaleli wrote his article in which he said how wonderful uh, the National Theater in Kampala was. This started a debate, a discussion, towards a true theater, was Professor Schoenker's response, that was published in a couple of places and started a really lively discussion about what African theater buildings should be like. Now, one of my fellow panelists over there and I have built a theater together, a very modest theater during youth weeks at the University of Malawi. And the kind of theater that was being built in Kampala was the last word in imitation without substance, to quote our keynote speaker. The trouble is, the same thing is happening today, and I was very glad to find in the welcome pack that among the James Curry um, publications, we have African theater number 15, because this is partly about the way in which China is building theaters in Africa as part of their campaign to win the hearts and minds. So that's why, excuse me, my, my address is really called From the CIA to the CIR via MRA. <laughs> because um, the Chinese and, and, and those who, who follow the Ghanaian newspapers and discussions will be uh, intrigued to notice that that the air conditioning system is in the theatre is so absolutely hopeless that people are describing the theatre as an oven. Um, it wasn't built for purposes that the theatre people, Efua Sutherland, her work was mentioned at McElroy, but she was not invited. Or, or if she was invited, she couldn't go. We must look at who was invited, who went, who was able to go, and, and what they brought. It was a fascinating example of how a conference is put together. And I hope that you're all thinking, how is this conference put together? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, James. Um, it's my <laughs> great pleasure to welcome Dr. Luisa Ekbenike is going to tell us the title of her paper. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you. Um, so just to echo the sentiment of my fellow panelists, it's a real honor and privilege to be here, to be at the uh, commemorative conference. Um, my head of department did comment yesterday that, so you're going to be speaking at a conference on a conference? And I said, yes, I am. And I explained the importance of this conference on a conference. Um, I have changed the title of my presentation, so do forgive me. Um, I do work on what I call the Igbo Nigerian novel, and I was thinking about uh, legacies of this conference and thinking about the sort of literary tradition that um, Chinua Achebe helped to shape, but I felt that I'd end up 
in a conversation around language, translation, um, the language of African literature, and I know that we're going to have those conversations in full later on today, so I thought I'd take a slightly different approach. So my paper is entitled, Revisiting the Makerere Conference, Writing Africa and its Diaspora. And what I am interested in, or what I will be speaking a bit about, is thinking about the kind of diasporic dimensions of the conference, thinking about sort of this pan-African undercurrent um, that was that sort of very much shaped the conference. Um, and I ex explore that through looking at the presence of writers like Langston Hughes. Now, I, I don't have very um, long to speak, and I, I know we are running a little bit late, so I'll try and, and whiz through it. So my apologies if it isn't as coherent as it could be, um, but I will, I will do my best to, um, to sort of present my thoughts as, as they have come to me on the page. In a letter to Ezekiel Mfalele, uh, dated May 18th, 1962, African-American writer Langston Hughes introduced the topic of what was then to be the upcoming conference at Makerere, remarking, nobody has ever told me what I'm expected to do at the conference, except be there. Whilst in, a sub in subsequent correspondence, Mfalele clarifies that Hughes had been asked to give a 45-minute statement on the American Negro literary scene, Hughes' inquiring statement is, in essence, showcases the dynamics of the space in which he was entering, in which conversations on Africa and African literature were pan-African in their vision, um, articulating the importance of engaging with and reflecting upon the interconnectivity of Africa and its diaspora. Of Hughes' presence at Makerere, Ngugiwa Thiongo comments, Langston Hughes gave the gathering breadth of geography and depth of history. He was one of the key figures in the Harlem Renaissance, which had influenced the founders of Negritude he had been to the Black Writers' Congress in Paris in 1956 and Rome in 1959, both attended by the great names of the black world, among them Franz Fanon, Emile Césaire, Sita Senghor, and Richard Wright. Thus, Hughes's presence in Kampala gave the Macquarie Conference symbolic connections to the Rome and Paris Congress, both organized by the great literary magazine Présence Africaine. Uh, Hughes has also reflected upon his renewed connection with Africa and its writers in an interview with a Soviet writer. He discusses the rise of new African nations, stating that it inspires me poetically as it is inspiring other Afro-American poets who see in their ancestral homeland a sunrise tomorrow. Poetry has a new subject to explore, a new theme to celebrate. And Langston Hughes actually went on to be um, the guest of honor I've read at this conference. Um, okay. At this conference, and sort of signaling part of this ongoing relationship between Africa and African literature and, um, and, and America and Amer African American writers. Um, and this was. This, was, this predates, this relationship that Hughes has to African literature predates the conference, having published the anthology An African Treasury in 1960. And then the year after the conference, uh, he would publish poems from black Africa, or he would edit, publish, he would edit poems from black Africa. So in the post-war arena of civil rights in America and the anti-colonial movements across Africa, the Makerere Conference provided an important space through which to envision the direction of African literature set against the backdrop of a rapidly changing global political arena. The conference held in June 1962 was on the cusp of Uganda's own independence, which would be secured on the 9th of October that year. The inclusion of Hughes, as well as other writers from Africa's diaspora, signaled the importance of a conversation that had already begun and would continue into the present day. And there has been a conversation around um, uh, sort of the gender divide or the sort of the, the disproportionate a number of men in relation to women in terms of the conference and, and we've also had a conversation about how African women writers actually are, are, are very vocal and actually leading, leading the field um, of African literature today. Um, but I also wanted to speak a little bit about Amat Aydou's works in relation to this idea of diaspora and this idea of connectivity that I've drawn from, from Hughes's presence. Um, and Amat Aydou has spoken about growing up in Ghana in the 1950s and 60s, and this space as being a space that has um, it's very international feel uh, with the return of people of African descent from the Americas and the presence of African diasporic communities in Ghana, she says, compelled the locals to begin to deal, albeit uncertainly, with the 
with that sorry part of recent histories of Africans and people of African descent. And she continues, I come from a people from whom, for some reason, the connection with African Americans or the Caribbean was a living thing, something of which we were always aware. In Nkrumah's Ghana, one met African Americans and people from the Caribbean. In my father's house, we were always getting visitors from all over. I think the whole question of how it was so many of our people could be enslaved and sold is very important. I've always thought that it is an area that must be probed. It probably holds one of the keys to our future. And so speaking into the silences of history, I do his own work foregrounds the experiential links between Africa and its diaspora, drawing on a trajectory between the different epochs of Atlantic crossings. I do's writings, for example, Dilemma of a Ghost, Anawa, and Our Sister Killjoy, present the temporal traffic between past, present, and futures, the Atlantic crossings between Africa, Europe, and the Americas, and the confrontation and recalibration of history while centering black women's narratives. In bridging temporal, physical, and cultural spaces, I do's probing narrative speaks into the silences of history, and in doing so, unveil the possibilities for the collective future of Africa and its diaspora. And so at a time when African people on both sides of the Atlantic were active in struggles to bring about their liberation, the convergences on African soil sought to strengthen and inform both struggles, rearticulating the Pan-African sentiment of the linked destinies of Africa's children. I'm just glancing at the clock. Um, the connection with Africa and the possibility of return loomed in the works of African-American writers such as County Cullum and Lorraine Hansbury, but also African writers in the 1960s and 70s, including Amata Aidu, as I mentioned, also Aikuyama. Maya Angelou and Malcolm X were among a group of African-American activists to spend time in Ghana during the 1960s. And in a speech delivered at the University of Ghana in May 1964, Malcolm X would state, I don't feel that I'm a visitor in Ghana or in any part of Africa. I feel that I am at home. I have been away for 400 years, but not of my own volition, not of my own will. His words were later echoed by James Baldwin on meeting Chinua Achebe, now on American soil, at the African Literature Association Conference in Gainesville, Florida in, in April 1980, whom he described as, my brother whom I met yesterday, who I have not seen in 400 years. It was never intended that we should meet. And for me, it's interesting that this conversation around connection, around heritage, around legacy, um, is playing out through writers um, and there is this, again, this sort of traffic across the Atlantic as writers are reconnecting. They will have engaged with each other's works already. They would have engaged with each other's ideas already in texts. And having these important spaces, I mean, we spoke about what conferences are, having these important spaces where people can come together, connect and exchange ideas, I think is, is key to the Macquarie Conference and to the subsequent meetings that I'm speaking to. So the sense of connectivity, exchange and the intertwined experiences has been sustained in writing on both sides of the Atlantic, as the changing global politics presents a new set of challenges for, people, for African people around the world. Um, and I think um, I've probably got a, how much, two, two more minutes, so in those two minutes, I will now <laughs> bring us into contemporary African literature. Um, interestingly, I am going to speak about homegoing and, and possibly present a more sympathetic view of that text. Um, so I'm thinking about so what I have here, which I might have to abandon, but what I wanted to point to here are two contemporary texts, um, Adichie's Americana um, and Yagyasi's Homegoing. And just to speak to Americana, I mean, I, I imagine many of you are familiar with that text. There's a narrative of Ifemelu who, who relocates to America. Um, and in the process of her time in the US, she starts writing a blog, um, which is called uh, Race Teenth or various observations about American blacks, those formerly known as Negroes, by a non-American black. And part of the novel looks at the process of being racialized as black in America. So in, in the US, um, Ifemelu is um, Igbo, she's Nigerian. She is black, but she doesn't read herself as black. And being in America, she, she's now racialized and recognized and identified as black. And so it's a kind of coming to terms with, with what it means to be a racialized person. Um, but also it 
puts her very much in communion with a range of experiences of people of African descent. And so there is a conversation that's being had in that text around a kind of renewed awareness of a kind of collective destiny and sort of linkages with other, other African experiences within the African diaspora. And when she returns to Lagos, she then writes another blog. And again, the digital space creates opportunities for exchanges that, um, that can take place across the globe, but in kind of, it's kind of an immediacy. So now we're in an era where these conversations don't have to necessarily be physically in the same space or sending letters that might take ages to be delivered, but can happen in a kind of more instant um, digital arena. And, and then just to speak to home going very, very briefly, um, Yagyasi grew up in America and she forms a, a, a newer, a younger African diaspora. And her text, Homegoing, looks at various generations. So it begin, opens in the, in the 18th century Ashanti village, and we have two sisters, one who's sold into slavery and taken to the US, and the other who remains in Ghana. And we see generation by generation, the parallel lives of the um, characters and the descendants of each of these women. And the final generation, I'll spoil it for those of you who haven't read it, they, um, they're both now in the US, and that also, again, speaks to the sort of changing um, economic and political climate. Um, and there is a reconnection. And the reader is privy to the experiences of each generation in a way that the characters are not. They don't know what their counterpart in America or their counterpart in, in uh, Ghana is going through. And the text itself um, is sort of almost symbolic of this sort of collective destiny that I spoke about, the sort of pan-African sentiment that was in the Macquarie Conference. The text itself is testament to that because we as the readers see how the experiences are intertwined and how these characters eventually will um, reconvene and will return to Ghana. And so in contemporary writings that explore um, the connection with the US, there's also this sense of return, a return to Africa. Um, and I think it's, it's very much in the spirit of, um, sort of Garveyist collective destiny, um, this sense of interconnectivity that was expressed in Makariri and also is expressed now. We're all meeting in the diaspora um, from different parts of the continent, having these conversations. So I think um, let that spirit continue. Thank you. Thank you so much, Louisa. Uh, we're going to have a short, short response from our discussant, Professor Sikamiza Mugadi. And I don't know if we'll have a q and A. I I may ask for your permission to give us 10 minutes of your lunch, but let's see how we go. Professor. Good morning. I hope it is morning. I haven't changed my, my watch. Um, I am going to try and be as brief as I possibly can. Um, uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, say uh, thanks to uh, Professor Shaink for uh, a presentation that I've been uh, waiting for for quite a while because I was raised on, um, on, on the legacy of, of, um, of the Makerere Conference, most of the literature that I started. Um, had um, its uh, genesis from, uh, from this historical moment. And 55 years later, I am able to say a few words um, about the conference. I must also thank um, uh, the panelists for um, really insightful um, uh, presentations on what uh, this conference uh, meant uh, uh, for them uh, and what it continues uh, to, me to mean today. Um, so I'm going to um, raise just a few points uh, pertaining to uh, what we've heard today, and perhaps to tease out some of the uh, some of the questions that uh, that came up, uh, and perhaps one of the uh, enduring um, questions that I um, that I picked up uh, was uh, that of um, Antinomies, uh, a conference uh, that was uh, uh, built on, on Antinomies uh, uh, you know, between uh, Francophone and Anglophone writers, between Romanticism and, and Materialism, um, 
a conference uh, that uh, at, at one time uh, was about uh, bringing African writers uh, together uh, to speak about uh, an African experience, uh, whether uh, at home or abroad, uh, but also a conference uh, that uh, asked um, uh, important questions about what constituted um, uh, the term itself, um, uh, Africa and, um, and, and African. Uh, and of course, uh, it was also a conference about uh, manifestos, negritude being uh, the, 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 the main manifesto and counter manifestos um, uh, from those who spoke uh, about uh, uh, what uh, the conference itself may have, uh, well, some of the questions that uh, the conference itself uh, may not have answered um, or even questions that the conference may not have uh, raised. Uh, we heard uh, today, uh, for example, uh, about uh, the problems uh, with uh, the way in which um, uh, Africa and uh, uh, Africans were, were constituted uh, in the romantic discourse uh, of negritude. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, the response, uh, the responses, say, by uh, Sambeno Osman um, um, about uh, the lack of uh, any uh, uh, any concern um, in, the, in, in the conference, uh, um, deliberations uh, about uh, the, the real material uh, conditions uh, of, of the continent and of those uh, of the continent that the conference sought to speak about and, and to speak for. Uh, we also uh, heard about uh, uh, the ways in which Africa itself had become uh, a construct of many uh, uh, of many ideas, uh, including religious, uh, political, uh, um, and so on, uh, ideas that further complicated this object and, of course, uh, needed to be addressed uh, uh, quite directly uh, by the conference. Uh, we also um, heard uh, um, about uh, the virtues uh, of, of, of this conference uh, the legacy uh, being that uh, the conference uh, uh, provided space uh, for a discussion of uh, a certain kind of, of, of African enlightenment, in other words, the way in which uh, Africans themselves were beginning to, to talk about their own writing, about their own presence uh, in, in, the intellectual, um, in the intellectual moment in which they found themselves, uh, so that... Um, uh, as Professor Schoenger pointed out, uh, that uh, the, perhaps the enduring significance of negritude was, uh, uh, well, what uh, it, it posited itself as not, uh, rather than um, uh, what uh, it came to be known as, in other words, as a romantic movement that had no uh, uh, relevance to, uh, to African conditions. In, in other words, in, in, in saying what it was not, uh, perhaps uh, it, it left a legacy uh, that uh, perhaps still remains with us a more open uh, and a more um, uh, productive legacy that uh, remains with us today. Uh, and of course the question uh, that I think uh, uh, formed a thread throughout the presentations uh, was uh, how does one revamp, how does one revisit, how does one reconstitute that optimism uh, um, in, 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 in negritude? Um, an optimism that uh, I believe has uh, continued to sustain uh, debate, that has continued to sustain um, uh, writing, uh, the connections, for example, that uh, Dr. Eponike uh, uh, spoke about. Uh, uh, the Negri oh, sorry, the, the Macquarie Conference was about connections across uh, across um, uh, continents, and uh, it, it did bring together uh, voices that uh, otherwise would not have come together. So, how does one re reconstitute that, uh, that, that stage? How does one, 55 years later, uh, reconstitute that, uh, that context? Uh, and uh, so I would uh, speak very briefly uh, to uh, Sefi Arthur's um, um, uh, presentation about taking stock. How do we take stock? How do we return, uh, perhaps with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, the, the benefit of experience to, uh, to the Makerere uh, moment? In other words, how are those uh, who um, have inherited the Makere legacy uh, supposed to keep it? In other words, how have they kept it? Uh, how um, are they supposed to keep it? Is there any script uh, that uh, we could follow? Uh, 
uh, perhaps there is no script uh, uh, precisely because uh, the legacy itself continues. Uh, it hasn't really been lost. Uh, it, it continues uh, uh, in uh, terms such as Afropolitanism. Uh, those terms may not uh, capture perhaps some of the gravities of, of the conference itself, but I think they gesture towards uh, something, uh, something uh, material, but also something, uh, something romantic. And I think that from the romanticism and the materialism of the Macarena Conference were important tensions, I, I think constituted important tensions uh, that perhaps uh, sustain, uh, sustain us and our writing today. Um, uh, we have uh, uh, notions of wealth citizenship, and I think Louisa spoke to uh, to the diaspora that uh, continues uh, to uh, to uh, to engender uh, uh, new connections, new ideas. Um, uh, in fact, James Baldwin wrote about uh, that uh, conference of black literature, uh, which took place in Paris. In his "Nobody Knows My Name," and I think that uh, returning to those texts could give us insight into uh, some of the ground that we have covered. Uh, both as, as, as intellectuals, uh, as creative writers, but also as people who at certain moments uh, come together to, uh, to speak about, uh, about these questions. Uh, and the question of, of endeavor uh, that uh, uh, Dr. Sefi Atta raised, um, the endeavors of the previous generation, the endeavors of uh, those who were at the conference uh, must be uh, must be recognized, but also they must be, uh, in some ways, emulated. Uh, well, with a critical eye, of course, uh, uh, and and that has happened. Uh, uh, that is what, in fact, our entire project uh, uh, is of, of scholarship is about. Uh, uh, the writings, for example, uh, of of of, of Emicheta, uh, the the tributes that are, are going to be paid to these writers today, uh, form that. Uh, I think that uh, background uh, uh, in which we still continue to, uh, well, against which we still continue to operate. Uh, uh, Pro Professor um, Siska uh, raised uh, the issue again of antinomies, uh, uh, the Macarena Conference as having been uh, an occasion uh, for ant antinomies, uh, of antinomies of history uh, and the present, antinomies of authenticity and in inauthenticity. Um, uh, of, of course, the famous uh, uh, rejoinder uh, uh, by Professor Shoyinka that the tiger does not declare its tigritude, it pounces, uh, were some of the questions that uh, I think uh, divided, well, but also uh, caused, I suppose, uh, productive friction uh, uh, for those who had attended the conference. Uh, so uh, the languages that we uh, that we speak today, uh, and in other words, languages uh, uh, that uh, suffuse our literary uh, our literary commitment, uh, uh, languages about authenticity, inauthenticity, have perhaps shifted uh, uh, to some extent. To those of uh, uh, to those of, of harmony, to those of uh, syncretism, to those of hybridity, but we must be vigilant uh, in, in using the new languages uh, that we don't uh, forget about uh, the continue uh, the continuing uh, uh, antinomies, uh, not just uh, within the continent but also across uh, continents in the diaspora. In other words, we must continue to be vigilant. Uh, um, to the ways in which Africa continues, Africa, African writers and Africans in general continue uh, uh, to be held uh, at, at some length, at some arm's length, at bay uh, by the places uh, in which they have existed uh, all their lives. So we must continue to be vigilant to the way in which Africa continues uh, to be constituted uh, in, uh, in, in a discourse that is not of Africa uh, in, in, uh, as, as, um, as a continent in need as a continent outside uh, of, uh, of time, outside of uh, any form of, uh, of progress. So uh, the connections, thank you, so the connections uh, remain uh, very much tenuous, the connections uh, between Africa and the world, between uh, those in Africa and outside of Africa uh, continue, to, continue to be tenuous and, and perhaps they need to be challenged uh, in, in, in a direct and, and, more, uh, and, and more enduring way. Uh, and uh, Dr. Kibbs uh, spoke uh, 
to the way in which uh, conferences are put together, and I think that it is an important uh, question uh, because it, it, it sort of allows us to go back to, uh, to, this, uh, to this moment and to ask questions about uh, the constitution of, of this conference, uh, who was there, uh, and, and the background uh, uh, to uh, the ways in which uh, uh, those who were there uh, came to be there. And I think that we do need a, a record of some sort, or at least uh, some uh, a generation of records uh, about, uh, about uh, uh, these moments because they are of historical significance. And I think without them, uh, we are, uh, to some extent, uh, part of, uh, of a story that is incomplete. Thank you very much. guided by the organizers and also by you, whether you have lots of questions and if you're willing to part with five minutes of your time to allow a QA. and a Any questions? Let's see the number of questions that we have in, in general. If you could let us see. Professor? Okay, how many hands? Can we see the number of questions we may have in general? Okay, we may be fine with the time that we have. We'll start with James. The word I want to say is Ibari, because I think that's one of the, the great mic. African words. A so, mic. Uh, uh, the word I want to say is Mbari, because I think that's one of the great African words. This was the Mbari African Writers Conference. Mbari was one of the great uh, achievements, the uh, Mbari Writers uh, Association of Nigeria, of artists and as well as writers. And I'm sad that this, this morning we haven't uh, uh, touched more on Mbari. Thank you. We have another question. Okay, we'll go there. Thank you. I just wish to confirm very quickly what James said. This conference was uh, a product of the Cold War. There's no question at all about that. The CIA on one side, KGB and the others, and, the, and this is one of the cultural offensives of the CIA. Uh, it operated, in fact, through Encounter magazine. I'm glad you brought a copy of that around. Encounter magazine was sort of the uh, distribution center. All this was discovered later on, by the way. We regret it very much. We didn't know about it earlier, because we'd have spent their money, a lot more of their money. <laughs> <laughs> very definitely, very definitely. And uh, encounter, the Congress for Cultural Freedom was also a product of the CIA via Farfield Foundation, which we discovered was also a CIA front. So CIA was laundering its money through various cultural channels. Mbari in Nigeria was a beneficiary of that as well. As I said, we just regretted. Nobody thought fit to tell us in advance so we'd have blown that CIA money thoroughly over so many <laughs> conferences. The quickly second uh, point is, I doubt very much if that picture is, I've been telling, uh, was from Makariri, from, at least from that conference. I think there's a, uh, a wrong identification of some of the figures there. You have to remember that people like me, you've been, look, I have so many doppelgangers I've been, mistaken, I've been mistaken for Don King, to my eternal disgust. I've been mistaken for Kofi Annan. Uh, the French are crazy about uh, this actor, um, oh, Morgan Freeman. And I get arrested at security. They pretend they're looking at my uh, boarding pass. In actual fact, they're passing it around saying it's not him. It's him. It's him. <laughs> so I doubt very much if this is, I mean, it looks like, but it could be Robert Serumaga. Could be. And somebody else, I can't, well, I'm not very sure about. I'm not very sure that's J.P. Clark. That's definitely Najat Nioji at the back. I'm glad you made the comment about ties. This was not a tie, suit and tie conference. It certainly wasn't. And I think I gave up ties before this conference. <laughs> By the time I got back to Nigeria, I wasn't wearing ties anymore. So there's a mystery about this which should uh, 
which can maybe can be solved by some of the participants here, but you should be very much aware of it. Okay, thank you. Um,